I'm the BCS Information Risk Management and Assurance Group's um, event coordinator for the Southern Region. Uh, this is my first stint in this role, so uh, please bear with me. Um, it's good to see so many of you here tonight, so thank you very much for making the effort to come along. And we've got an exciting talk with uh, Mike on uh, cloud assurance this evening. Many of you will already be very familiar with him. Um, in terms of getting speakers for the BCS events, um, it's always very interesting to get quite a range. And a lot of you here are professionals working in the field. So we would really welcome some of you to actually come forward and volunteer to actually speak to your peers as well. If anyone is interested in doing so, please contact me either via email, um, the link's in the email that went out about the event, or speak to me after the event tonight. Okay? Um, what would also be interesting to see is, could we just get a show of hands, please, on who is present, member of the BCS, but not a member of this specific group? Uh, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of you. Oh, no, ten. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. And um, how about those of you who aren't a member of the BCS at all? Show of hands. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Brilliant. Excellent. Okay, so that's really good to have a nice mix there. Um, we would really hope that if you enjoyed tonight's event, we all see running these each month, and there's lots of other events that the BCS run as well, that we'd encourage you to sign up as a member and uh, support the society and the professional work that we're doing. Um, also, I don't know if any of you are aware, we have a LinkedIn group for the um, BCS Irma event. And what we'll be doing this time, slightly differently to normal, we'll be posting some threads about key learning points that come out of Mike's talk this evening. And we'd like you to come along and join in that discussion and share what you've learned and any challenges you're facing around cloud assurance. Um, and finally, um, could I please ask you all to hold your questions to the end? The session is being recorded so that people who aren't able to come along in person can watch it on our BCS Panopto channel after the event. And because you aren't mic'd up, um, those would actually interrupt the flow of the presentation. So please hold your questions until the end, and Mike will be happy to take them on for you. Okay, so with no further ado, main highlight of the evening. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well, good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Some of you know me. If you don't know me, I'm Mike Small. I worked for 27 years for a company called ICL, then for 15 years for CA, which was formerly Computer Associates. And when I retired, I became a, an industry analyst and a university lecturer. So my wife complains that I retired from one job and got two. So I've been interested in the cloud since um, certainly the mid-noughties. And the, the thing that stirred me into this was the fact that the organization I was working for uh, bought Salesforce.com for their sales team. And you might say, well, so what? But it was just after they paid a very large amount of money for SAP systems to bring the accounting of sales under control. So I thought, whatever is this cloud all about? And so I've been researching and writing about the cloud uh, for many years. And <clears throat> this talk, which I kind of put together rather at the last minute, uh, is, is, if you will, the lessons, is based on the lessons that we have learned from the research that we have done into the cloud and the products that are around security and governance in the cloud. And a lot of work that we have done with uh, customers of cloud services for whom we've been giving advice. So I hope that uh, our, our lessons learned, if you will, will be useful. <coughs> and, ah, right. So I'm going to look first of all at uh, the perspectives of the cloud, and it seems to me that different parties have different views of what the cloud is and what it's for and what they mean by risk. And this leads you on to a question of what the risks really are and how an organization should go about governing the cloud and uh, a description of some of the tools and processes that we've created to help organizations that are 
uh, concerned about using the cloud to look at the risk and to implement governance. And that includes a new kind of tool that seems to have emerged, which is focused on exactly that problem of finding out who is using the cloud and controlling access uh, by those people to which clouds they are allowed to use. So when we look at the different perspectives of the cloud, it seems to me that there are two distinct uh, groups of people that buy it. And in the example that I gave you earlier on of, of CA buying the cloud, there is absolutely no question that that decision was made by a business person. And so many of the, many of the, the purchases of the cloud are made by business people and their view of risk is often very different to the view of risk that comes from an IT person. And the business, if you will, is, is concerned about agility primarily. Can we keep up with our competitors? Is the cloud going to give us that edge? And one of the, the things that cloud services allegedly uh, help with is the ability to develop systems or to implement systems more rapidly than you would have done uh, using uh, the previous set of technology. And there's lots and lots of examples of organizations which even range from uh, large oil companies that, that found that by using cloud services, they were able to go from weeks and months of trying to acquire the uh, the hardware that they needed to develop new applications to being able to put these things on board in, in a controlled and governed fashion in 24 hours. Um, and the other thing that, that, that is, is the problem, when you talk to the business people about the cloud, they will, they will look at it in terms of the business risk of not using the cloud. If I don't have this application, then I'm going to lose out to my competitors, I'm going to miss this opportunity. And so they don't have the same perspective as perhaps many of us in the audience do. Whereas the IT person has t traditionally looked at the cloud as being something which is going to give cost reduction, it's going to improve their efficiency, and uh, do this by migrating what they already have, which is usually very difficult, and their uh, concern at the end of all of this is security and compliance. And so often these two, pe these two sides of the organization, when they talk about risk, mean entirely different things by the word risk. And that is uh, one of the challenges that needs to be overcome. Now, when um, you look at this, there are, in fact, many challenges to do with uh, using the cloud. And it's interesting that five or six years ago, when you talk to an organization about what their concerns about the cloud were, they would talk about security. My data is out of my control and things like this. In fact, that has mutated, if you will, into a concern about compliance. Uh, because most organizations have put quite a lot of work into complying with regulations and um, moving outside of, moving their data and moving their systems outside of their control poses a question of, well, how am I going to know whether or not I remain in compliance? And the cost of being non-compliant could be very large. Um, the, the, other, the other things tend to have, shall we say, reduced in in the, uh, the importance from their, their perspective. Uh, for example, uh, whilst lock-in remains a problem, uh, and most organizations have already kind of given in to the notion that whatever IT systems you buy, you're locking yourself in to some degree or another. Um, there are nevertheless some commercial sides to this. And to, to kind of put it in an example, I gave one of my home computers to a relative over the weekend. And this had on it, I think it was Office 2007, or maybe it was Office 2010, but it was still working. And it was free. There it was, 
on this computer. I now have Office 365, and if I don't pay my subscription in 12 months, it's gone. And so many people haven't thought of this. In, in the traditional world of IT, you bought a server, you knew it was going to be out of date in a few years, but it was still yours, and it was still there, and as long as it didn't actually set on fire, you could still hope to keep using it. But when you move to the cloud, it's a subscription model. And if you stop paying your subscription, it all goes away very, very quickly. But to um, look at one of the main drivers, one of the main things that people are worried about is this, this new thing <coughs> called the uh, General Data Protection Regulations from the EU. And that is a major concern for nearly all organizations, including the Americans, although they haven't quite realized it in many cases yet. Um, and whether or not you like it, your organization is going to remain responsible for it if, even if your cloud provider makes the mistake. Now, the, big, the good thing about the GDPR is that um, it's also going to put some responsibilities on the service provider as well as on the, um, on, on the customer. So understanding your... Uh, the division of responsibilities is, is really quite critical to understanding what the risks are to do with using the cloud. And the other challenge is the, the concerns about data leakage. And this is particularly acute in Germany. I mean, it, it's very interesting when I talk to German customers because the, the, there are still German customers who are basically convinced that it is against German law to move any of their data outside of Germany under any circumstances. Um, and so over the past two or three years, you've seen, uh, first of all, it was Amazon who denied it. And Amazon AWS said, well, it's fine. We've got a data center in, I think it was Amsterdam or whatever. But eventually they brought their availability zone into uh, into Germany. That was followed by IBM who moved their um, uh, cloud, their um, software cloud pods into Germany. And only today I received a, um, a press announcement from Microsoft telling me how Office 365 was now available, completely delivered in Germany. Everything was done in Germany. And part of the reason behind this is the suspicion that somehow or other this American cloud provider is subject to the Patriot Act and they are going to uh, be able to be have your data demanded from them <coughs> by uh, the law enforcement or by some kind of uh, federal agency and they will have to give it over and they won't tell you. And there's now quite a lot of product that's been designed to, uh, shall we say, deal with that kind of issue. So, what, well, that takes us on to the question of governance. And basically, I say to people, you have to move to a governance-based approach because you're no longer in charge of it. And this is, this is one of the challenges for IT people that we've done a tremendous job of teaching our young IT people I say young because I'm obviously well over the hill here, and in how to do things properly themselves, how to build secure systems and so forth. But what we haven't taught them and what we haven't trained them in is how to get other people to do it and how to manage other people doing it. And that's really what governance is all about. And I put down here, it, it, in a sense it is, how can you achieve the governance, uh, how can you achieve the business goal and uh, from the hazard type risks that come around uh, cloud, you're identifying what those risks are and you're being able to relate those risks back to the business objectives. And this is where, you know, kind of the major problems that, that we've come across are that organizations haven't done it. You have no idea how many organizations I've come across that have said, well, what we've done is we have put 
a questionnaire out to all of these different cloud service providers and we've now got 60 questionnaires here and well actually we don't know what to do with them because they haven't sat down and said what are we going to use the cloud for what is the objective of that use and what are the constraints on that use and what risks are we prepared to accept so I have this very simple view of cloud governance and here is the theory that you really should have some kind of business objectives and some kind of cloud policy and if you don't have a policy then you know how can you say to someone who has decided to put your intellectual property on YouTube well that was against the rules we clearly told you that we don't publish that kind of stuff in that way so you need to have some kind of objectives and some kind of policy and those things lead to what the needs are for security and compliance and they also lead to in an ideal world a procurement process which says when we're going to use the cloud there is a clear description of what it is we wanted and that's if you will the thing that is often missing because the cloud sale is the so-called golf course sale but you know the, the the sales director was on the golf course with somebody who persuaded him that this cloud service would give him his customer needs uh, more quickly than he could ever buy it any other way and often that is a thing that is missed and that should in this real world lead to a view of a set of potential vendors and before you buy you go through some kind of risk analysis process which identifies um, whether or not you're going to go with it uh, what the controls you should have would be and whether and if you accept it then clearly these are what the controls should be and that leads you to an implementation phase which allows you to then when you deploy it you actually monitor how it's used and you bring some kind of remediation in if necessary now that is not kind of rocket science but in fact it's often something which somehow or other the cloud has just wiped all kinds of thoughts out of organizations heads or um, they've been forced into it because some business person just bypassed it and so the reality is often you find yourself in in this that the line of business users said look we know we need XYZ or we know we need to have some kind of development and they sort of bypass all of this process and what you need to do is to be able to work in a world where you have that ideal world and maybe you're moving somewhere along the line towards it but that you are also able to bring under this governance model the, the cloud that has really um, been deployed and I will talk more about that uh, in, in, in a few moments so as I was saying having a cloud objectives and policy is kind of fundamental to this some people will say well some organizations said to me well we, we, we don't we're not a cloud business it's just another form of IT you know we don't have objectives for the cloud but if you don't understand that your your employees your associates are going to use it because they're using it every day they are going to use it because they're trying to get the job done and if they can get the job done by sending messages between themselves on Instagram if they decide that having a Facebook page for employees of your organization is a really great idea then they're going to do it if as actually came across they found that they could not send a video to an outlying station of some important process then they will do it by posting it on YouTube and all of those things are examples of what I have come across mainly because there was no policy in the organization which said 
hey guys, this is what you are allowed to do with the cloud, and this is what you are not allowed to do. And so, if you don't have those things, there is <coughs> no way you can have a policy for acceptable use, and there is no way you can understand how, what is different about the procurement of cloud services. So, that's kind of pretty fundamental. And it's interesting that this is a policy, so I'm not talking about a really, really deep uh, set of procedures. In fact, this is an interesting one, because this is the International Federation for the Red Cross. And they actually gave a talk to us uh, about how they had been using the cloud. And this was, if you will, their policy, which said, um, you know, here is the kinds of data that we hold, and they hold a lot of very sensitive data. And um, what kinds of data are we prepared to put in cloud services? And basically, you know, if you look here, what they called restricted and highly restricted, they were only prepared to put into a cloud with restrictions, i.e. specific terms or specific controls that were definitely under their control. So at least having something like that is, is, is uh, really important. Now to give you the other end of the spectrum, I came across another organization which was uh, a local government and they just basically had a prohibition. We do not use the cloud. Under no circumstances will we use the cloud. Well, in some ways you can understand it because local authorities hold a great deal of information about very sensitive people, you know, it's the sensitive personal information about vulnerable adults, vulnerable children, and things like this. But it took a long time before somebody actually said, why does the library department want to hold or want to use Dropbox? And eventually somebody asked them, and the answer was that the library department was responsible for the printing of publicity material for the council and that they could get a better and cheaper deal with the printer if they sent the artwork for the publicity material via Dropbox to the printer. So the material that was going into the cloud was basically the contents of posters that were going to be put as soon as they had been printed, were going to be put on the walls of the town hall and on the walls of everywhere that they could post it. So it was hardly information that fitted into the highly sensitive uh, category. So, you know, you have to understand what you're actually uh, looking at. So, well, so eventually we ended up saying, we, we needed to have a way of talking to people about um, what the risks really were. And uh, if you remember Tom Lear as Lobachevsky, then remember his plagiarize, plagiarize, why do, you, why do you think the good Lord made your eyes? But always be sure to call it research. So what we decided is it's much easier for people to decide from a list whether or not something is a risk than for you to actually get them to sit down and come up with a list in the first place. And once you've got them started, they can then um, uh, move on with it. So we, we effectively produced a spreadsheet with a lot of risks in it. And um, we say to people, we want you to review this risk list in the context of the specific case that you're looking at. And you need to go through that review, which identifies who is responsible for that risk. Look at the controls you could put in place and identify which of these you could do. And come to a view about what you think the residual risk really is. And some of these risks may well be ones that, in fact, don't apply, like in the case that I just gave you of the printer and so So. What we did was we took the risks based on the INISA study, and we, uh, this is a well-known document, 
and we basically put them into a spreadsheet and said, if you look at what Anissa says the inherent risk is, this is where we stop. And so you can uh, work your way through that risk. And interestingly, you start off by looking at the impact tends to be, um, the inherent impact tends to be uh, based irrespective of what the kind of service is. But the probability is considered to be something that changes depending upon whether you've got a public cloud or a private cloud. So we then put that together with a set of recommended controls for each of these risks. Now you might say, why have we created this set of controls? They cost us ISO and uh, ISO 27001 and all of that. And there is the CSA and all of these kinds of things. Well, when you look through most of the existing lists of controls, most of them are uh, ones that you want the cloud provider to implement, but they're not controls that you can implement yourself. So you need to kind of have, if it's a governance approach, a thing that says, well, we want the cloud provider to prove to us that they are implementing these controls, which takes you kind of a level higher than that. So uh, when you start to look at this, uh, you find what we've done is we've looked at each of the risks and said, for each of those risks, we can say there is a set of assets which are potentially uh, associated with it. Here's a, a very interesting one, it's lock-in. So you can look at the, the assets that actually are impacted by, uh, by that risk. And then you go through a process which says, well, is the risk really important to us? Are the things that we are being locked into things that matter? And what would the impact be? So we redefine the inherent risk in the specific context. Then having, having done that, you can then go through what the controls might be. And I'm trying to sort of think of what these controls are because you can't read them. But if you look at the controls to do with this, you can say, well, does the contract actually say I can get my data back? Now, you know, you might, you might say that's a stupid thing to ask, but often it's not something that anybody's asked. And I know of at least one case where an organization had to pay a great deal of money to get their data back. And if it, if it is coming back, is it actually going to come back in a usable format? You know, I might have a highly structured database and saying, well, you can get it back as comma-separated uh, CSV files may not actually be what, uh, what they need. You can then say, is there actually a set of APIs which would allow me to get the data back? And have you tested those APIs? Do they really work? And um, if, if, if you've got that, then you can add on to that something which says, to what extent are you going to get technically locked into that, uh, that cloud? And many, many people might say, well, that's just a price of working with Microsoft or whoever, because as soon as we make a choice like that in technology, we have to do it. But there are indeed sets of standards there, uh, and, and different people are uh, quite um, possessive of these standards, you know. There's, uh, uh, things that have come from uh, uh, the OCCI and there is um, some standards to do with data management that have, have, have moved into ISO standards. So having done all of that, you then come to a view about what the residual risk might be. And so I don't think this anything I've described up to now is rocket science, but it has actually helped organizations to go through that process of de deciding what the real risks that are involved for them in moving uh, a particular application to a particular cloud service provider. And uh, in that respect, it's been extremely helpful. Now, the other thing that, that is often forgotten in all of this, and I said at the very beginning, you have to understand who is responsible for what. And I would say that, uh, for example, the majority of cloud service providers, certainly the big ones, 
are able to take a great deal more care over securing the infrastructure upon which their systems uh, are running than most, uh, most um, specific uh, organizations can. And they can do this because of the volume of scale they have. And so to give you an example I was, I was quoting earlier on, which is AWS have a simple rule which says once a data storage device has crossed the line into a data center, it will never leave that data center physically in one piece. It doesn't matter if it, if it was a lemon, it still gets shredded. And so most organizations would not go to that extent. They'd want to get their money back and they might have some kind of degaussing or whatever. However, you have to understand which things you are responsible for and which things the cloud service provider is responsible for. And certainly in the lists of controls that we are putting down, be asking yourself the question of do I understand who is responsible for what? And this table here shows you that actually the division of responsibility is something that depends upon the kind of service so if, for example, you are using a software as a service, an Office 365, a CRM system or something like that, then you find that the provider is really uh, has a significantly more responsibility than if you are using infrastructure as a service where you've built your own application, you've loaded your own application, and you're running that yourself. So, for example, if you are running an IAS virtual machine, then you are responsible for securing the uh, server, the operating system and so forth. And, and whilst the, uh, the cloud service provider may provide you with a protected infrastructure, it doesn't mean that the if you haven't patched the OS, that something couldn't get into your system that could compromise that OS. So you really need to be very clear about this. And you, you ideally, the cloud service provider is open about this. And there is, if you will, a charter or a document that says clearly what they are responsible for and what you are responsible for. So. One of the key things to do with um, understanding the risk and managing the risk is certification. Now the reason for that is that a cloud service provider will not, in general terms, allow any organization that is using their uh, cloud service to do their own audits. And for perfectly reasonable reasons, that they have so many customers, they couldn't afford to have all of these customers coming and crawling over their service. And indeed, the more people that they let in that understand what their intellectual property is and how they are actually securing it, the greater the chances that they will have some kind of compromise. So here is a set of assurance levels which are loosely based on the ones that you find that are published by the UK government the CESG, but not precisely. So the first thing is that you may say, well, I'm, I'm happy with it because the service provider says it. The brochure says we do this or we don't do that. The brochure and the documents that go with it make a claim. So that's kind of a self-assertion and that may be good if you trust the cloud service provider. Um, indeed, it may be for small businesses, that's about as far as they can go because they don't have the knowledge to go any further. Then you can say, well, actually, we're all right because it's in the contract. And I remember having this long debate with an organization because they immediately wanted to do the risk assessment and the people that arrived in the room were the lawyers. And the lawyers were convinced that if only got, they got the contract right, then everything would be sorted. But not everybody 
can afford to sue a large American cloud service provider with their contract written in some odd place in the US. So the contract is only as good as your ability to enforce it. And since most of the contracts were written by the cloud service providers anyway, and most of the service level agreements were written by the cloud service providers rather than you, that kind of somewhat limits the value of those things. They may be better than nothing, but anyway, when you read them, you find that actually they, they really give you very little. So then something better than that is having some kind of independent validation of the, uh, the service. And I've mentioned here uh, a service organization control report, uh, type one report, where basically the, control, the controls have been uh, determined by the auditor to exist, but have not been tested. So better than that is one where the controls have been determined to exist and they have actually been tested by some kind of independent person. So that is kind of pretty much state of the art for most of the things that, uh, that um, uh, y y you can get out of cloud service providers. Now there are a number of products that have come along that claim to put the control back in the hand of the customer. And that, if you will, is what most people really want when it comes down to it. They, they would like to be, be able to control the encryption of the data themselves. So those are the um, sorts of levels of assurance that you might uh, find yourself looking for. So when the cloud service provider says, we do this, you should be looking for an independent proof of the fact that they do it from a trusted third party usually. And so uh, there's a lot of potential um, things that they can produce as evidence. And indeed, if you go and look at some of the cloud service provider websites, it's like acronym, you know, you do a compliance compliance XYZ service, and it comes up with acronym soup is what I would describe it. You've got millions of things they claim to be compliant with. Well, it actually really only matters what things are going to affect you. So I've picked out uh, three different um, compliance type standards. And the first one is ISO 27017. Now this is actually really quite interesting because the ISO 27002, which I'm sure you're all familiar with and love and so forth, in fact was written on the assumption that the, the reader is actually running their own services. So. ISO have gone through that and they've provided an additional set of guidance and controls which are for both the cloud provider and the cloud customer, if you will, based on ISO 27001 and 27002. So that's useful because it gives you, if you will, a different slant on those controls. And they include things like um, understanding shared roles and responsibility, removal of customer assets. That's the, the one I was talking to about, can I have my data back, please? And what they are doing to ensure that there is um, segregation between the, the customer's environments and how they actually, how the cloud service provider does the administration. You know. Do, do, does the cloud service provider have a dedicated set of terminals on a dedicated network which is separated from the business type uh, stuff from, through which people do uh, administration? Or can anybody rock up to any business PC and do a bit of tampering with your, uh, your, um, your, your system? 
and how are the systems monitored. Now, when you get one of those things, you, you actually then have to say, well, what can I do with it? If, I, if they say to me, that's what they do, then you can go through the risks and you can say, look at the risks and say, is the, re is the certification relevant to the risk that I am concerned about? And if it is, then does it actually change either the inherent, uh, the, the impact or the probability of those things? And these, um, so for example, if you look, if you're concerned that the cloud service provider would be acquired by somebody else, and that would have an adverse effect, and you might say, well, is that going to happen? Virtue Stream was owned by, part owned by SAP, and it now is using VMware, and it's been acquired by EMC. So, does that alter anything? Uh, but it doesn't actually, it does in fact, reduce the probability of some technical risks. So you have to understand, when you look at a risk, whether or not this, this wonderful certification that you've been told uh, may have, does it actually do anything for the specific risks that I've got? And um, now I'm sure you all know about these, the uh, st statement on standards for attestation engagements number 16. Wonderful. This is, this is basically the document that describes the background to service organization control reports. And there are three different kinds of report. There is the SOC 1 report, which was the equivalent to the SAS 70, which is basically a report of are the financial systems being run correctly. SOC 2 is operational compliance. And SOC 3 is general use report with some kind of a public seal. And there are the different for SOC 2, there are the different report types where the audit tested whether or not the controls existed and tested whether or not the controls were effective. So when you look at that, you find that actually there are, uh, for the SOC 2 reports, there are five different areas that the SOC 2 report could cover, availability, security, confidentiality, integrity, and uh, privacy, I think it is. So, if, you, if they say, as they often do, we have got a SOC 2 report, which one of those things did it cover? And there's only a couple of cloud service providers that I know of that actually have a SOC 2 report that covers everything. Most of them just will say, well, it's availability. Uh, and um, uh, whilst I'm on that, whilst I'm on that particular role, I have asked cloud service providers who have said to me, we have an ISO 27001 certificate. When you say, can I see it? They say, oh yeah, well, here it is. And it turned out that what they actually had, or what they were, what they were giving me, was the ISO 27001 certificate for Equinix. Because they said, well, we're running an Equinix data center. So their certificate didn't actually cover the service they were providing, it simply covered the, the environment in which they ran the service, which is not quite the same thing. So um, if you get a SOC 2 report, you need to look more in more detail as to what it means. And even if uh, it, it does cover what you uh, are thinking about, and I've looked at something here to do with uh, SOC 2 for uh, availability. It does cover some things, but it doesn't alter, for example, the data protection risks. So, um, I could go on through many of these other different ones, but uh, I don't want to uh, talk all night. So, with that I'm going to move on to what is effectively a group of new pieces of software or technology that have arrived in the marketplace whose 
uh, basic purpose is to do with monitoring and controlling access to the cloud. And these have come up under the general heading of cloud access security brokers. And there's the many and varied. And uh, we've uh, done an analysis of these, uh, uh, these different products. But basically, what they are doing, which makes them really very useful, is they focus on this little area here, which is that if you want to see how a cloud service that you are using is being used, and which cloud services are being used, then they give you a wonderful insight into this, in the sense that to some, in some way or another, what these things do is they monitor traffic that is leaving your organization and going towards um, the internet and they understand where the cloud service providers are and how to recognize traffic that is going to them and they can detect whether or not the cloud services are being used and to depending upon the actual uh, details of the individual products, they may be able to uh, say which service and who is using it and what data is being moved to that service. Now, not all of them do that to all of that uh, extent. And some of them will even go further and be able to say, well, we can control which people can access which cloud services and which data can be moved into which cloud services. But at the end of this, you get a chance for you to be able to see in your organization what is going on. Having done some of the things that we've talked about before, it gives you visibility into the cloud and it gives you control over access to the cloud. And so when you look at them, the first key thing that they do is they intercept or they monitor and uh, look at traffic that is going to the cloud. Now, sometimes this is done by means of appliances that are installed in your um, network. Sometimes it is provided as a cloud service so that your traffic is kind of routed via, um, uh, via them. But nevertheless, it, it gives you a measure of what is being used. And one of the things that, that, that the products will do as well is that they have built up a, a register, if you will, of tens of thousands of cloud services. And some of them uh, have gone even further and they have risk ratings. So some of the, the, the bigger uh, NSPs uh, have got involved in this and they use their knowledge of um, risk through the monitoring of the, the internet and the managed security services that they're providing to be able to put risk assessments against the different cloud service providers. So when you get the list, you can actually get a list which says these are the risky ones and they are being used. You then are able to uh, make a choice and say what you can do is you can put a block in which says that the, these people or these groups of people can only access these specific cloud services. And um, that is usually tied into your internal identity and access management systems so that you can, uh, uh, you, 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 can, you can do this and you can give your customers, if you will, your users within the organization some kind of a a dashboard, a, um, a, an entry screen, which allows them to pick which services uh, they want to use from the ones that are allowed. Um, and uh, so it, it provides a way for you to control uh, users, individual users or organizations, who bypass the purchasing process bypass the risk assessment process so at least they're only using things that you have uh, uh, confirmed fit within the policy. And um, then 
Uh, and then, finally, one of the things that you, you can do with these things is that they often integrate with conventional data leak prevention tools, and some of them have their own data leak prevention tools, so that when data is sent to the cloud, it will scan it to see whether or not it actually contains the, the kind of things that, uh, that you don't want to be sent to the cloud in the usual sort of way. And this can either work through metadata that's put in by a DLP type uh, solution, or it can work through actual scanning the, the content of these things. And it will then, they will then, to some degree or another, will do things like they will enforce encryption, or they will uh, quarantine and not allow the stuff to be sent there. Uh, or take different kinds of action to just prevent it. Now, by doing that, they also have a, a side effect, which is that because they are monitoring who is doing what and monitoring what is being sent out of the organization, they actually add to the, uh, the cyber risk posture, if you will, because uh, often the way that data is exfiltrated is by hijacking of accounts and it's really abnormal activity that's going on. So it gives you another string to the bow of being able to protect your data uh, against um, advanced persistent threats, basically. So that is the story about cloud access security. So with that, I'm going to move on to the summary. And uh, I think basically what the problem is that we know what we should be doing, but we don't always do it very well. And what's needed is to have a proper governance process, which is integrated in with all the other things for how we use the cloud, which <coughs> means we understand what it is the objectives of using the cloud were, we have a way of doing an analysis of the real risks associated with using the cloud as opposed to um, the, the, the risks that we, we sort of feel in our, in, in our stomachs. And that we can go through this on a case-by-case -case basis and use things like certification to give us uh, a, a, an approach that will help us to reduce the risks around the use of the cloud. And some technology has emerged which allows us to control access. And so with that, um, that is my talk. So I, I'm now ready for questions if any of you have them. Thank you very much for uh, an informative evening. Uh, my name is Vijay Panchanathan from Management Support Services. Um, you talked about the big providers such as uh, AWS, and we have we have clients who have their data with AWS, others with Microsoft. In terms of the the little guys looking up to the big guys and saying, you know, can you? How secure is our data with you? It 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 begs the question. You know, how do you actually approach it? How do you? Uh, how do the little guys look up to the big guys and say, "We want to touch this system or provide this assurance"? It's almost as if saying, "Look, go away. We're the big guys." Well, and and that in a sense is what what I've been talking about, which is that. The large cloud service providers are so much larger than nearly any, even large organizations in terms of the IT uh, systems that they have, that you are always, if you will, the little guy. And so the process that I've been talking about is a process that you need to go through, either um, in greater or lesser depth. And there isn't 
a single answer to this. You know, you know I, I mean, if you look at me and, uh, and, and a, a, a small business, you know, I, I've seen one or two friends that I have that have small businesses, and I would say to them, look, Office 365 is so much safer than what I know you have at the moment, which is you have a five-year-old server sitting underneath your desk, and your, your, your idea of security is you've got an Alsatian outside. Now, so in, in some ways, these guys are doing so much better than many of the very small ones. For the larger organization, the question is, what is the ban balance? Is the balance, you, you know, how many organizations under how many circumstances are getting a specific business benefit from their IT systems? Increasingly, many of the IT systems that organizations run are, if you will, hygiene. They're the equivalent of the lights have to come on. You know, uh, again, my, my example of office productivity tools, how can any organization or many organizations say it really is worth us running our own office productivity tools ourselves? You know, for most organizations, there are a number of providers who would do that, and many are already using hosting of some form or another. But on the other hand, if you are a, an oil company and your intellectual property is in your uh, geological research and assessment, then there is the value of your company. If you are a pharmaceutical and the whole of your uh, intellectual property is in some formula of your, your thing, then maybe uh, there, there is a way of, uh, of, of seeing that as being something that gives you an individual uh, benefit. So that, if you will, is my answer. Thank you for that. Just, just, a, just a point on that. So, if if the um, if the smaller businesses want to get assurance from the big boys, will they entertain us asking them questions, or can we simply say, "Well, they're Microsoft; we have to trust them"? Well, again, the answer is how small is small. So there are invariably a number of different layers. Now, everybody can look at and understand the assurances and the contract that the cloud service provider gives. It may be that small companies don't bother. It's like, I would say, how many people have read and digested the um, contract that you've had from your electricity provider? You don't. You just want gas. You just want electricity. So. You, you know, or, or you want your phone. You don't read the thing. You just say, when can it start? Now, so there's, there's companies and there's individuals that won't do that. Now, if you look, for example, and you, you mentioned Microsoft. Well, Microsoft has sort of tiers. Microsoft, Microsoft work through partners, but there are a number of, um, if, if you will, services that they provide called fast-track services around the cloud, which kick in for free once you get to 150 users, for example, for some of them. Um, so at that point, you start to get more support and you can ask more questions. But I mean, you, you know, if I rang up Microsoft with my home office or whatever it is and said, can you just explain these details to me? You, you, you wouldn't really get a, a, or expect a very good uh, Thank you. detail response. Hi, Mike. Um, <coughs> I was really trying to get a little bit more out of this on, in terms of governance and insurance. I work with a number of organisations who um, are very clear that the governance deal is that, um, let's, say, let's say it's the MOD, I don't want my stuff to end up in the wrong, well, outside certain boundaries, let's say. How do I get the assurance? I, I, okay, I can go to a cloud service provider and say, this is what I want, and they can say, yeah, great, no worries, we'll do it. So where does my assurance come in that they're actually doing 
what they say in the contract that I've signed with them. Well, in a way, that's what I was trying to describe in the later part. That you can say, a con saying they do it in a contract is one level of assurance. Actually having an independent test that um, they're doing it is another level. Yeah. And in the, in, in the CESG uh, idea, yeah. they have a further level, which is you have had an independent assessment of the design of the system that confirms that it was designed to do what it was sent to do. So it isn't just being tested after the event, but it was sort of like a common criteria. It was designed to do it. So um, as an outsider, that is the best that you can get in terms of assurance. Now, in, there, there are a lot of things that have been uh, done that will add to that confidence. And so your comment about geolocation, uh, and, and I started off by talking about how I think Microsoft have gone in with T systems so that, that for people in Germany that are really, really, really concerned about it, you can buy what is effectively a version of Azure, which is untouched by Microsoft hands, so they can't be subpoenaed in some American court to do it. But it is Azure and, and all of the stuff run by a German organization in a physically located uh, data center in Germany. Now, so depending on how far you are on the paranoia scale, you, 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 can, you can sort of uh, uh, look for those kinds of things. And there are uh, different, different people now. For example, all the big cloud service providers know that governments have lots of money and they want to pay lots of money because they've heard the cloud is good. So they nearly all of them, to some degree or another, created sub-clouds that conform with government needs like that. And indeed, Amazon, uh, I think, uh, it, it is in the course of opening <coughs> a data center intended for that. Um, I think HP already had one, uh, which was selling their cloud to the UK government. They certainly have federally accredited data centers that, that meet the US federal standards for, for that kind of thing. So there we are. That's great. Thank you. Yes, there's a question over uh, there. Good evening. Uh, it's John Holm. Very interesting talk. Thanks very much. If a business has been led by the business saying we like uh, cloud services implemented and IT have gone storming ahead and done it, what are the odds of getting retrospective governance in place with the service provider? What, so the, the question you're asking is... Everything's on the cloud, IT, for example. IT, IT just did it. Uh, sorry. IT, yeah, did, what, IT did, it. did what the business wanted. And Applications sat on the cloud. Yes, and so... And the realisation of the governance process is now... So, in, in effect... What are the odds of retrospective governance? Well, it, as with all of these things, what, and again, this is a case I've, I've come across, what you actually do is you say, you say to them, well, here's where we are. Let's now go and do this retrospective risk analysis. And you go through what the risks are, and you go through what the controls that are already in place are, which may or may not be on, anything from zero upwards. Uh, and then you go through a dialogue that says, is this good enough? And often, the, the answer is that it is, because sometimes the business people have made the right decision without thinking about it. They've, they've made a balanced view about some kind of business opportunity or cost-saving opportunity, which, um, which was not, if you will, talked through 
but when analysed is not far from 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 being okay. See what the uh, punitive damage of coming out of the contract is. Well, no, that, that's interesting because, well, there, there are there there are cloud providers, but one of the good things about most of the cloud services is that they are, um, in, in terms of contractual, they are really sort of charged on a monthly basis at the, at the most. I mean. You've, you've got to actually work quite hard to, to, to sign a, an annual contract with these people because it will give you uh, some kind of price reduction. So the, the challenge is not actually getting out of it in terms of contractual um, locking that way. It may be more likely things to do with your data and getting your data back and doing, some, doing it in some other way. One more. <laughs> Are they obliged to delete and get rid of all your data, backups, everything, if you terminate the contract? Ah, yes. Not now, that, that's actually one of, one of the things that, that is on the list of questions, which is what happens to your data under a whole host of circumstances? Like, when, you, you know, let's say that you, you get moved from one virtual disk to another virtual disk, does the next person that uses that bit of the virtual disk get it? What precautions are taken against that? When the devices themselves reach the end of life, what happens to them? Uh, and what happens to uh, backups and so forth at the end of contract? And again, there's a range of things where they, they, they will say, yeah, well, we do it, through to we'll actually give you a certificate to say we've destroyed it if you have it. Yes, so I think, uh, is, is Sarge got a question? Mike, I think you answered the question about retrospective already, because by virtue of the fact that most cloud agreements are contractual, it's not something you need to do retrospectively, but something you need to cover for going forward. And therefore, when you come to renewing cloud contracts and so on, you should be doing third-party SLAs. Now, your point is very well taken about business decided to get the checkbook out and buy it. IT then has to try to armor plate it in some way. That's the reality of the situation. But in the IT world and also in the governance world, what we are doing, of course, is trying to establish SLAs for different circumstances, look at KPIs, KRIs, all that sort of stuff. So those should take care of quite a lot of it. But my question is really relating to bodies such as the Cloud Security Alliance, CSA, Cloud Security Forum, CSF, and so on. They are membership organizations, CSA certainly is membership organizations with roughly 50 large organizations amongst their members. Surely they are performing due diligence or SLA type activities of the sort we had for SOX with the um, SAS 70s and so on. They provide the assurance based on certain factors that you can use their services knowing that you are relatively secure. Yes, so that, that's, that's a good point. And in a way, this is a point to do with um, the, the independent assessment standards that you can look at. And I talked about a couple of them. That the, the Cloud Security Alliance that you allude to there started off with a self-assessment register. They have moved on to a... Um, an independent assessment process and they are moving to their plan is to move to a continuous assessment which is kind of good um, whether or not they're doing uh, what is required for the customers to some extent depends upon whether or not you feel that you are part of the same a kind of organization that's a member of that and the CSA was 
specifically started by the big cloud providers to try and to try and get that. Um, so, in a way, it's like all this. You know, standards are great. Let's have more standards. So, <laughs> so yes, thank you. Yes. So, Mich Michaela's. Yeah, hi. I just want to add to that that um, because of you doing this talk and the Cloud Security Alliance UK chapter, um, we've got a new chair, um, Alex, for the Cloud Security Alliance, and we're in discussions at the moment about him coming along to do a presentation to us to talk a bit more about the CSA star model. Okay, thank you. Yes, there's a question. That's the last one, please. We, can, um, we, we would like to invite you, um, all of you, to continue this discussion in our uh, LinkedIn um, group. If you're a member of Irma, you can join to uh, our LinkedIn group. If, if you're not, you haven't joined already. So we can continue this discussion over there. And the last one. Thanks. Hi there, Andy. Uh, great talk, uh, Mike. Thanks for that. Mike, my, my question is when you were talking about the uh, monitoring uh, the access and you mentioned these new companies that can perform that for a uh, for a business and that 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 company will somehow interrogate or look at the data figure out where it's going which cloud going to etc I think you mentioned that they can actually do that within your own premises or in some way you can route it to them uh, correct me if I'm wrong understanding so if that is the case, then, and mention, of course, while doing that, there's an added governance in that, you know, they can maybe figure out if something, you know, somebody's got access to a server or to, to something in terms of doing something with the data. And that's, that's great. But also isn't there in the other side, in that if you're routing your data to before that's... do within that organization to get access to the data. So but those companies also sub the um, regulations or governance that you'd expect the cloud service provider to be subject to as well. Okay, so this is about cloud access security brokers. And cloud access security brokers is a new kind of product some of which is being offered as software as a service, i.e. In inherently goes via the cloud. And some of, it, some of them are on-premise uh, appliances. So in a sense, you, you, you have a choice of uh, which kind of product you want. Um, and you make your decision about that based on your concerns over uh, the, the kinds of issues that you've been raising. So they started off primarily as being appliances. Appliances that sit somewhere at the network edge and uh, sometimes they will at the, the network edge also provide uh, encryption of data with keys being held on premise. So effectively, and, and this is if you will uh, what it, it, a lot of people that are sort of feeling paranoid like you about anything going out of the organization can say, they, they can say, well, we know that anything that leaves to go into a cloud service is going to be encrypted before it hits that cloud service. And all of the control over the keys is held uh, on our premises under our control. And that was, if you will, their main selling point. Now that's sort of mutated into... Uh, well, we can do it as a service for you, because the problem with uh, with doing it on premise is if you've got a mobile phone and you use your mobile phone as a man in the middle, so you exfiltrate the document and then you upload it to Dropbox or whatever. That isn't necessarily uh, controlled, but. Uh, that's, that's the kind of problem they're trying to deal with. So I think that was the last question, is it? So I've got to say thank you very thank, much. Thank you, everyone. Questions. We've got some sandwiches as well.
help yourself a sandwich and, and wine. Uh, I'll take the wine over there, so 